under five minutes of the light color and under ten minutes of the darker color. And you can see it starts with, like, with the urban core and then just branches out. And pretty soon it's everywhere. Um, and just completely covers the city. Um, same thing in, in Paris. Starts from the urban core and just expands rapidly. And you can see now it's like, you know, these, this, in, in Paris it's even to pick up times with the, the light of dots. But same, same deal. So we've been able to get to the point where, um, you know, this is very reliable. Like you can, you can rely on a car in that small amount of time. Um, you know, most taxi services never achieve this. They, you know, for all kinds of different reasons that I won't get into, um, never can achieve the reliability or the affordability in either dimension of it. And this is why people are starting to sell. We're actually, we have data on how many people are actually selling their cars or giving up one of their cars and using Uber uh, as their only form of transportation around the city. This is actually a really interesting graph too, which shows that Uber rush hour is really when the bars close <laughs> or they start closing. And, and you know, that's because a couple things happen. One, people really don't trust themselves to drive. Um, but two, and, this, and that shows the data, by the way. Um, two is that uh, you know, the uh, public transit and taxis become harder to get. So, and Uber continually, you know, with, through your pricing and through the way our, our network is managed, remains highly reliable. And so we have this surge that occurs, and that kind of surge of pricing, the surge of usage, um, you know, that occurs you know, around, around bar closure time. Um, we've seen actually, um, there's a number of different studies we've done to look at what impact we've had on DUIs and um, alcohol related deaths and all sorts of things. And these are down by between 5 and 10 percent in cities, you know, sort of after the group established itself in the city versus before it was there. And as it, we actually, we've got uh, Uber and Lyft were you know, pulled out of Austin over a fingerprinting thing, which is, we, we thought was a discriminatory move on, on the, the city's part. Um, and when we did that, the, the, the police, uh, you know, they are reporting to us, they saw an increase in DUIs and alcohol related accidents, which is, is depressing. So hopefully we'll go back in there and resolve that. Um, this, is, this is actually really interesting, although somewhat difficult to see. Uh, I'm sorry, we need a better visual, but um, this, this, this is showing uh, pickup locations in New York. And the, the sort of brighter dots are a taxi, and the blue dots are Uber. And as you can see, as, as, as the years have gone by, Uber has expanded into the five boroughs. Um, it has pickups all over the place, whereas taxi stage very concentrated in Manhattan. And, um, and we, we do have actually uh, three times more pickups and drop-offs in the outer boroughs than the taxi does. So we, and the reason for that is because it's, there's, there's, it's, there's kind of like destination blindness in Uber. And in AV, you can imagine a autonomous vehicle, self-driving vehicle, um, it's even more so, right? I mean, there's still some cases where drivers will call and say, where are you going, you know? Um, but, but the way it works with Uber is we don't reveal your destination until the, until the trip starts. So you're in the car. And the driver selects the thing, and then they, you know, so you don't get the thing where I live in Manhattan for five years, and you know, I had to like, I would go out to the sidewalk, especially during rush hour, if I wanted to go to the Guardia or JFK, I had to hide my suitcase because I knew that they actually just wanted lots of little trips around the city at that time of day. I hide my suitcase so I get picked up, and I run over and grab my suitcase out of the bush and jump in the car and try to do it before I drive away, um, and that worked out half the time. Really happen, half the time it happened. So, uh, so yeah, so it's a, it's just a totally, it's a much more reliable service in that way. Um, this is also showing uh, economically underserved areas of the city. So this is in Paris. These blue kind of like blobs are, uh, are you know, areas of the city is indicated are under privileged zones. And you see Uber, which is all the blue lines, serve almost all of them, um, which definitely is not the case with taxi in, in, in Paris. Um, and this is showing London and how we complementing complement public transit. So uh, th we, uh, we have data that shows 30% of our trips in London um, uh, start from or end at a tube stop, um, within 200 meters of a tube stop. And when they launched the night tube in London, which a lot of people take the tube out of the city center, um, we saw uh, at nighttime, we saw these nighttime pickups shift from the city center to the outer boroughs. Um, so just it's really good evidence that there's a strong correlation. That's what people are using it. They're using for the kind of long haul. They're using the uh, the public transit and for the rest of the three Uber. We think it's a really great pattern for the city. Um, I'm gonna, I'll skip these. This is basically talking about how cities are starting to integrate uh, Uber into their into their fabric um, in a couple of different ways. Um, this visual um, is is uh, because the concept of Uber pool is almost as complex as the concept of quantum computing. <laughs> and so I want you to look at this very carefully and then you'll understand Uber pool. Okay, there you go. Boom. <laughs> um, this is, we had this it's super simple idea, right? And in fact, it's right when I started, we, we started attacking this. We said, look, you know, um, we have enough liquidity in the network now that we should seriously look at whether we can get people to share a ride. Because that's the dream, right? We get to the point where people actually share a vehicle, um, start taking cars off the road. You're already taking cars off the road with ride sharing because you have less people driving around, fewer cars driving around looking for parking. Um, but you do, it takes it to the next level and you have three or four people sharing a ride. And so we said, okay, let's just, just let's experiment. 
right? We, we literally, in three weeks, we built an experimental version of Uber Pool and launched it. It was really bad. Um, but it was, it, was, it was bad in just the right way. It was just good enough. It had a high enough fidelity that we could trust the experimental result. This is what we talked about in the webinar. You have to experiment to be very lightweight, but not so lightweight that you can't trust the result because it's like that bad. Like us are projecting because the experience is terrible. So it had good enough that we could actually learn that, okay, this is going to work. And then we kept iterating and iterating and iterating on the model until we figured out what would, what would cause it to take off, and it exploded. 50% of our trips in San Francisco today are pool trips. And the reason is because people are willing to uh, you know, share a trip in order to share a car with somebody in order to save money, especially when you think of it as an everyday thing. And um, this is actually a graph that shows uh, you know, what would have happened you know, in, um, in, in traffic volume if we had left these, the pool trips in San Francisco unpooled. And they're actually fairly old data, too, because you can see the left is much more, there are many more hot spots. So we're having actually a detectable material impact on traffic in San Francisco by launching Uber Pool, which is really exciting. So this is one of the big, so we're not, now we're really talking about affordability, it's one of the big cost drivers. Now you combine pooling with um, self-driving, and you get numbers that are crazy low. Um, so low that it makes the cost of car ownership look ridiculously luxurious. Um, you would, you know, you're gonna, it'll get to the point where people are like, I just, it makes no sense to own a car. It's just with the reliability of ride sharing and, you know, and the prices being as low as they are, you know, the sort of, you know, the, the dimes per mile kind of thing, um, you're, it's just, it's, it makes no sense to pay insurance and pay for parking and pay for maintenance and buy the car in the first place at the capital outlay. So that's what we're really targeting is can we get the cost, the price so low that it just doesn't make sense to own a car anymore. Uh, see. So this is some data. Um, I'll, I'll actually end on this, um, but because it's just fun. But um, so far, in the first seven months of twenty, oh, in the first seven months of twenty sixteen, and so we 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 update this data. This is from the first seven months of twenty sixteen. Um, we saved three hundred twenty uh, three hundred twelve million miles of driving by using pool. And, and I like the fact that it's greater than the distance between Earth and Mars. And then for this group, I have the footnote. And this is when they're both at the epiphelion, you know, epiphelion, or epiphelion, and the opposite sides of the sun. Because I know you guys are sitting out there going, well, you know, the Earth and Mars are different distances from each other at different points in their orbit. So, dude, come on, be specific. Um, so, I anticipated that and I fed you with the, you know, the, uh, the right answer. So um, I'm, I'm going to stop there so we can start the conversation, but I want to get, I think that context kind of lays out why, uh, you know, ride sharing and AV pieces go together so important and so uh, extremely. Fantastic. Let's bring our chair.